Hola amigos, ¿cómo están? En esta ocasión estamos en la Sweden Game Conference, que es un festival de videojuegos. Estoy aquí con Dan, a quien voy a entrevistar, y les vamos a contar un poquito sobre cómo es trabajar en la industria. Hola Dan. Hola. ¿Puedes contarnos a qué te dedicas? Eh, estoy trabajando con un videojuego, se llama Planet of Lana. Eh, y estoy trabajando con el diseño de juego, el game design y otras cosas también. Eh, somos un, un estudio bastante pequeño, somos eh, 15 personas, un, algo así. Eh, entonces, cada persona hace varias cosas en, en, en el estudio. ¿Y ustedes están en Gotemburgo? Estamos uh -huh. en Gotemburgo. Sí, ¿Y sí. crees que es fácil para alguien que estudia en Hövde uh -huh. el encontrar trabajo en Gotemburgo? Eh, ¿En nuestro estudio o en general? En general. En general. Eh, difícil decir. Eh, bueno, primero no, no soy de, de ahí, eh, de Gotemburgo, que he vivido ahí como un año más o menos. Entonces no, no estoy súper seguro sobre la situación de, en la industria de videojuegos ahí. Pero hay, hay algunas empresas ahí, pero sé también aquí en, en Hovde, hay muchos por, por ser un, 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 una ciudad tan pequeña, hay sí. muchas empresas de videojuegos aquí. Sí. Pero bueno, Gotemburgo es un poco más una ciudad más grande, entonces hay, hay muchas cosas ahí. Mm, es verdad. ¿Y sientes que alguien que no habla sueco uh -huh. puede estudiar? Porque hay programas que son enteramente en inglés. Sí. ¿Crees que pueden trabajar también enteramente en inglés o necesitan saber sueco? Sí, no. Yo creo que es posible. Por ejemplo, es como trabajar un, un persona en el equipo es italiano. Uh -huh. Eh, vive en Italia también, eh, tra está teletrabajando de desde allí. Y no y habla estamos sueco. Estamos hablando en inglés. Ok. Eh, todo en inglés. Una otra persona eh, trabaja con eh, la música. Mm. Es eh, estadounidense. Uh -huh. eh, Pero <risa> Entonces fun funciona, sí. Ok. Pero depende del estudio, creo. Para mm. Normalmente va bien con inglés. Mm. Y, sí. Ok. Y por ejemplo, en México, al menos cuando yo vivía ahí, no había realmente una educación para desarrollar videojuegos, hasta donde yo sé. Como que estaba muy bebé, la industria apenas empezaba. Ahora está mejor, pero obviamente Suecia está mucho más avanzado. ¿Tú crees que Suecia es un lugar donde la gente puede venir desde Latinoamérica y trabajar y tener mejores oportunidades que en México? Mm, posiblemente. Yo no sé muy bien la situación en, en México, pero... Pero sí, yo creo que la, la cosa más importante es tener como un, un bien eh, portfolio, mm. eh, cosas que has hecho, mm -hmm. que puedes enseñar, eh, la educación. ¿Qué opinan los suecos de las personas que vienen de Latinoamérica? ¿Son bienvenidos aquí? Sí, yo creo que sí. El sueco es bastante abierto mm. para, para gente de fuera. Sí. <risa> <¿Sabes>? <risa> Lo has visto ya. Siento que conectamos con cosas diferentes, sí. como que aquí es más conectar a través de trabajo y aspiraciones, hobbies, sí. y al menos en México es más como sentimientos, relaciones más como personales. Sí, es y más aquí, fácil ¿no? sí. encontrar amigos fuera, sí. en Suecia un poco más difícil. Sí, pero una vez que logras entrar, sí, ya, sí. o sea, es, la gente es súper amable, siempre sí. están ahí para apoyarte, o sea, es más como el primer shock cultural sí. cuando de repente te sientas con alguien y no es tan fácil hablar de un tema como más privado, pero una vez que ya cruzas esa barrera, sí, ya, sí, sí. Pero incluso para mí, como un sueco, yo no soy, soy de Gotemburgo, por ejemplo, y no es tan fácil para mí tampoco no. hacer nuevos amigos. Uh -huh. Yo tengo varios de, de, de otros lugares. ¿Tienes una amiga en Hubde? Sí. <risa> <risa> y, pero es, es un aspecto de, de la cultura en Suecia sí. especial. 
mm. yo creo. ¿Y de qué ciudad eres? Eh, soy de Kalmar, es una ciudad pequeña en el uh, sureste más o menos. Okay. Pero también viví 10 años en Estocolmo, ah. eh, he trabajado mucho con eh, eh, vídeo y animación. Mm -hmm. Como por, por muchos años, 10 años o algo, ah, antes wow. de videojuegos. Mm. Y realmente para mí videojuegos, trabajar con eso es bastante nuevo. Que, pero tengo muchas cosas de, de animación que mm. puedo usar mm. para videojuegos también. Y, wow. y, y video y, y ver imágenes que, que mueven. Yeah. No, pues súper interesante. Y si, por ejemplo, alguien quisiera venir a Suecia y empezar su carrera aquí, ¿sientes que tiene futuro el, el tener una carrera en la industria de los videojuegos? O sea, que va para largo plazo y que alguien puede vivir toda su vida en la industria. Yo creo que sí. Eh, lo, lo mejor para, para entrar en la, la cultura sueca creo que es encontrar un trabajo. Mm. Y eh, ahí puede, puedes encontrar amigos y... y aprender más los suecos mm. <risa> son, son un poco difíciles a veces eh, pero sí. yeah. bueno pues muchas gracias por la entrevista y todos nuestros amigos de la comunidad te agradecemos tu tiempo y esperamos verte pronto en otro video that we start with an industry panel uh, for the opening session. And I have some really great people for you. Let's see, where, do you, where should I be? All right. And also, I have a, another part of the Swedish games industry office, Anton Alpin. And um, uh, he's, uh, going to be, he's going to be on uh, the Discord monitor. So this is Anton, a big hand for Anton. <laughs> And while you're at it, while you're clapping, why don't you do a, 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 a clap for Johanna as well? Because uh, she's such a wonderful and doing a super Let's see. Let's go back to this really nice picture with all the cool games on it and have that as a backdrop for our talk. Because this is really the source of the success, uh, all the cool games that we make in Sweden. Anton, do you have a mic over there? I do. Excellent, and we can hear you. How are you doing this morning? Good, how are you? Excellent, great to see you. Long time. How have you been? I've been good. Since so, like 11 at night <laughs> last night when we saw you. Yeah, yeah, let's not talk about last night. <laughs> um, so, uh, you're, on, you're on your laptop. Yeah. And you're meant to uh, be the sort of voice of all the people who are not in this room. Right. All yeah. the thousands or millions of people who are following this from Yay! Come on stage, please! And I have Paul Pettersson, I have Jenny Brusk, whom you just met, and I have Agnieszka Malskaya-Pettersson. Welcome! What a great time. What about Putta? No, I want Putta as well. Let's uh, let's bring Putta on stage. Join the all female panel, Putta. Come. Yeah, we can't <laughs> have we can't side. have all female panels. Really? We can have all male panels. And why can we have? All yeah, th but it's you, a you need to bring your own chairs. From yeah. the... <laughs> it's it's such a big step for us. The dark side. <laughs> and it's been very much uh, in the spotlight in the recent month around uh, uh, unacceptable behavior, sexual harassment. Um, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the dark side of the family happiness. Um, do you um, is this a, a surprise to you, Jenny, that these things come up now? No. 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 <laughs> That's what we call a leading question. I get question. that question. I get that question very often, and I and it's like, oh, were you shocked? Like, uh, no. I mean, I've seen this happening like every I don't know five years or so since then. The beginning of the history. Uh, it's, less, it's, it's, it's boring, it's sad, uh, but I mean, it, 
I think it was you who reminded me that that Gamergate was seven years. I thought it was about you know five years ago, but it was in 2014, and it's, it's actually seven years ago. But before that, we had the One Reason Why movement, and before that, we just didn't talk about that. In it, it, of course, we had it, but we never talked about it because this was not something that you talked about previously. So I'm so happy that we are actually talking about it. We're talking about discrimination and sexual harassment and all of that, but we never did that before. So I think that's, you know, that's good, on the other hand. Yeah, so that was my next question. Did you, did you see some evolution of the issue, or is it the same all I over? Mean, the evolution is that previously it existed, but we didn't talk about it. And then uh, we started talking about it, and some smaller changes happened, you know, after the, the one reason why some things started to happen, but then after Gamergate, I would say it kind of exploded because the companies had to make a decision. They had to sort of choose sides. Are we going to uh, sort of work against this or are we just going to sort of uh, let it happen because this is our community we're talking about. We want to keep our players even though they harass other players. Uh, and I think most companies actually did take a stand against sexual harassment and, and, and bullying and, and hatred and all of that kind of threats that were going on. Uh, so, and after that I felt, okay, we, we went through this, because during Gamergate, I, I should honestly say that I was like, okay, I will leave the game industry now. I'm so tired of this. But then I, I don't know, I never give up, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, no, no, let's keep on fighting. And so there it has happened a lot, I think. But of course, we will always have these bad, up, uh, bad apples. And there is an attitude within the games industry that we just have to get away from, and that is the rockstar mentality. Uh, we share this with uh, yeah, the music industry, we share it with uh, the film industry, we share it with other types of industries, where you have this male genius. Can we just say that they don't exist? Can we just agree on that? There is like, it's not one person who creates a game, it's a team. And of course, you can have uh, someone who comes up with the idea, and then you want to. Okay, but this is like this is a genius who just made this fantastic idea. But there's so much bullshit. And if we can get rid of that, and we can just accept that these are often also same as the perpetrator, then maybe we can start getting you know somewhere, moving forward. I think. So there are no rock stars. There are only really good people and they don't have to be, you know, the one we praise. There are several people. Gangs of people. Gangs of people. <laughs> Great. Good good point, Danny. Thanks. I think that's something we can all take to heart. Uh, Agnieszka, um, let me ask you, there's also like formal legal responsibilities for an employer to act when there is a report of sexual harassment or other unacceptable behavior. Um, I'm curious if you have some experience representing the, the, the employer. How, how does a, an employer, what should an employer do? Do you have some advice? And if you don't have some advice, I have another question for you. Yeah. So you can choose whether you I, want this or the advice. next one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we talked about it recently as well at Mindark. Uh, and uh, just saying that we have no cases reported doesn't mean that that doesn't happen, you know? And, uh, so what shall you do? Because very often, uh, I mean, I, when I talk to female friends, there's a lot of like, almost all of them have had experiences at work or somewhere that they were catcalled or whatever. And uh, they just don't report because we're so used to it. It's like, eh, that's nothing. But you know, we started talking about like, remember to, to report or talk to someone about, so if, you, if something happens to you, like we said it, uh, we announced it at the, the announcements for the whole company, like, that if you don't feel comfortable, because it's not often you feel comfortable with coming to someone uh, talking about it, or if it's your manager, or if it's maybe the, the highest person in the company, who do you go to, to then? So we have like one person, we have the discrimination and inclusion officer, and uh, she's a part of the company um, that anybody can, can uh, call to, so that's like a legal, formal way to go. Uh, and also, if anyone feels like they don't want to uh, talk about it within the company, you just go to, uh, I think, uh, the unions, fuck it, has a responsibility. So you can go to, I can't remember if there was a special number that you can call and you can report it, so you, you just you don't even go to it within your company if it feels uncomfortable. So that's what we 
what we, which way we do, because we thought that it's it's much better if, if it's dealt with, like you know, legally, formally. Not that we hide it within the company and say we don't have anything. Nothing happens. Good answer. Thank you, Johanna. And then I want to ask for a question about building teams and, and formal responsibilities. Yeah, uh, that legal report system is actually coming into uh, European law for for all all the bigger companies. Uh, in the coming years, that could be good, good to be aware of. It. But uh, one thing I, I think is important to remember is that this needs to be um, this is ongoing work. Uh, as as you saw in the numbers, we are increasing uh, the, the employees in the industry, but the people working in the industry are increasing all the time. We have a lot of cultures coming to the industry. We are a really really international industry, but workplace country culture differs from, from like Sweden and Denmark. I worked in Denmark for a couple of years at a French company. That was like three different three different workplace cultures into one one small little office. And I think that's also things that we need to, to think about. So I think we need to see this as an ongoing ongoing task and ongoing work because you never finish. You, we need to re-educate ourselves. We need to uh, talk about it, we need to uh, talk about it to all new employees, we need to remind all employees about everything, we need to to speak about it in the industry and to have informal networks and formal networks and, and safe spaces for, for everyone. So, um, un unfortunately it exists, but I think talking about it will only help us becoming better around it. Thanks, Jana. Put that. Uh, so, when you hear this, uh, how, what, what's in your mind around all the different cultures that are in your international um, portfolio of companies, I guess? And, and, and also the point about rock stars and team. It would be interesting to hear, what, what, do you have a practical application? Yeah, first I, I just want to say uh, that it's really good, Jenny. Like this rock star myth, it's a, it is bullshit and it needs to... We're, we're nerds, that's how we got started. We love to play games and that's what it's about. We should, we should acknowledge that that's, that's who we are. We should never lose our footing in, this, in the way that we think that we are in a position to do something that we're not, not allowed to do. <clears throat> I think also the, now the industry is sort of uh, I wouldn't say that it started now, it's, but it's, you feel like it, it comes back, right? It's the, like this pest that won't go away. <laughs> I think we at Thunderful, we are, we, are, we, are, we are learning to do this. I mean, we, are, we have ways to go until we are secure in how it is in our workplace. And I must say that, me personally, I don't want to work in a place where this is uh, prevalent. So it's... Personally, I need. I feel that it needs to. It needs to be. A sh we need to ensure that it doesn't happen at all. Because if it happens, uh, then you cannot deal with this in a good way. There is no good way for for the company to come clean after you have had an incident or multiple incidents like this. I think also it's 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 so prevalent. Like where I think every. A female friend, I, I was talking to her about this, and she said, you know, every girl or woman has, has a lot of friends who have been subjected to some sort of, a, of abuse in, in, a, in a sexual manner. It, we're, that, because that's what we're talking about now. I mean, bullying gen, in general, of course, also needs to, needs to be rooted out. But yeah, every woman knows a lot of, they have a lot of female friends who have been subjected to it. If you ask a guy, he probably could not name one of his male friends who is a sexual perpetrator. That is, that is how, how skewed or, or wrong this is. I think we have, I'm ultimately responsible for a group of 400 people, a little, little more than 400 people now in different countries. We will need to look at every, uh, like every company to see what they are doing. And, and I, I just wanted to re reiterate that we have a long way to go. Like, 
still in our in our board of directors, four out of five are men. In our in our sea level, still everybody is a man. If if you don't, you mentioned now, I said that you have you have a person in place, a woman who who uh, people can uh, approach and talk to about this. We don't have that yet today. We're certainly getting it. Uh, because I think, if something happens, who are they going to talk to? Are they going to talk to me? Like a middle-aged white guy who, is, who, who, could prop, who could possibly be at the very center of this problem. Uh, and uh, it, needs to, it needs to stop. It needs to go away. I don't think it's a, it's not a gaming industry specific problem, but I think that this rock star myth that we get from music and, 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 and movies and so on, it has sort of translated into games. I think we are different than musicians and filmmakers because I don't think we are born rock stars, most of us. We are the ones who work Maybe not all of us were popular at school and so on. We got into games and making games and made friends who have the same interests because we are who we are. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't let like an industry define or redefine who we are or what we think about that. It needs to go away. Good. Thanks, Putte. And uh, as, as you can see, and I want to say this to those of you, again, pursuing a future in this industry, you're, you're watching the change happen. You're watching learning happening on this stage, on this very stage, and that's a process that's going throughout the industry. So there's, um, uh, yeah, the, the change is happening. We have a few more minutes. Uh, I'd like to open for questions. So anyone in the room, start thinking about the question. I think Anton might have somebody on Discord. Yes. So we have a question on a related topic to this uh, by Yvonne Technique for Italian. She's asking, I'm curious to hear why there are less female employees than males in games business. Is it because more boys than girls play games in general? Does this also reflect in the number of male game students versus female students? All right. Jan yeah, maybe okay. has numbers. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to uh, why there are fewer women in the games industry, it's of course because there are fewer women in the education. And that is typically because we, it is very, very gender stereotyped when it comes to anything that has to do with technology. It's very gender stereotyped. So we say that, you know, it's like men kind of, you know, are born with just a, a huge interest in technologies and women just don't understand anything. And this is how we're raised and this is also something that young women are told and girls are told that, oh no, that's not for you, it's, uh, this is all like, you shouldn't pursue that kind of career. Uh, so we have had a lot of work just trying to reach out to those before they are too indoctrinated by, by society and, and trying to sort of inspire them to become game developers. And, and then also, of course, reach out to other areas, you know, we have a lot of women doing, you know, arts and, and humanities and that sort of, and that is also important uh, knowledge to have in, in the games industry. This is also part of creating a game. So we reach out and try to recruit them to, to the games educations. And then, in, you know, in the end, we will have more female game developers. We just have to sort of get them into the system much earlier. So. Yeah. How different is the experience for today's right. students? Thanks, Thanks you've all done that for 10 or, or, or 15 years ago. Everything. Yeah? I mean, first of all, it's a much better education, but also the community helps them, you know, find new paths out in the industry. Uh, as of now, like as I told you yesterday, we had this Donna Day, and half of the people in the panel were former students uh, in you know in game development here in Skövde, so it's like it's a payback culture, which means that it's growing and growing, and we learn more, and we learn from each other, and we also help each other. So there's also this exchange between uh, professional game developers and students, and I think here in Skövde it's easy because everyone is you know close by. We have the companies just a few hundred meters away, so I think this it becomes a very strong community and a strong payback mentality and I think that is really, really successful. 
It sounds like it's not so much in the teaching in the classroom. No. But it's more in the environment that's, outside. That's when you think that the teacher is supposed to be the one handing you a lot of information, I think you're mistaken because it's actually the community has been, I mean, we can only support, you know, and provide certain things. But it's actually everything around it that is sort of what you can bring with you, you know, after graduation. So, of course, we can give you sort of the basics and we can show you and direct you in various ways, but uh, we cannot give you your career. You have to sort of grab it. <laughs> so, let me put that in other words. To you students out there, here is a professor telling you, don't do your homework, go no. to the <laughs> office partners from all these companies. Do both. Okay. And also do your own stuff. Don't just do what the school says is going to do. Do it because you want to learn and do it more than we say you should do it. So, do your homework and more. Perhaps. Do your homework and but don't work get on your portfolio. Out. Don't get burnt out. So and it's very just... difficult and tricky, but I think you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, come see us after if you want more guidance. We can make like a weekly schedule for yeah. your Tuesday homework, Wednesday portfolio, Friday office party. All right, Anjeska, uh, the theme for this year's conference is crossing borders. When you hear those words, what, 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 what the, the thoughts come into your mind? Uh, well, actually, I was thinking about uh, that we've crossed a lot of borders between work and, and home uh, these uh, recent years because of COVID, and uh, that there is no border anymore between these uh, two for us, so we have to be a bit careful there. Then, as well, because I'm from Poland, in, in Polish border, the word border is also the same word as verge or limit. And it's like I'm, I'm directly thinking about verge of mental uh, despair and, and <laughs> mental uh, health. So it's like it's. I think it's very important that we are in it together. We're crossing. We're not crossing this border, hopefully, uh, but we're helping each other, and we have to be very careful, uh, caring actually for each other, a bit extra checking in on on our friends and on our on our, on our colleagues and on everyone, and uh, trying to care for each other a bit more. And, and about games, how, how can games cross borders? Games, <clears throat> I don't know. Can they help in that community? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, you can play good? together. Yeah, of course. You can play together. You can, uh, there's plenty of games. There's plenty of things you can do together on the internet. You have a lot of technology that can connect you. Uh, yeah. I don't know. And, and in your work, I mean, this is this is really like warm-hearted uh, <laughs> answers that you give. In your work in the industry, sometimes the industry comes across as a, a rough place, and, and people have to work hard, and it's all about delivering. And sometimes the fans can get ugly on, on forums, etc. But you you speak of such warm things. Uh, how does this carry over to your work? Well, it's my job. <laughs> I work as uh, I basically work as a person who who tries to help people become the best of what they want to be at work. So it's like agile coach. We work with uh, organizational changes, trying to help people to to uh, to connect, to communicate, to remember. Sometimes when we have conflicts, there's always going to be conflicts. We have a lot of artists who have put their hearts into the products, and and we put. Um, there's going to always be those conflicts and, and differences, but I always try to remind people that we're here for the same goal, you know, and that we're trying to achieve, we're trying to do the best game ever, uh, probably all of us in, in all the gaming uh, studios. And uh, of course, fans can get ugly, but it also, I think, they can give you a lot of, like, what I'm always trying to, to work with and what I've seen as also it goes was that whenever you see the, the best, like um, energy people get, the developers, was when they could see the users and the players play their games that they developed. There was so much, so much energy in the, for the developers to see like a Gamescom or wherever, where you see queues of people like, you know, waiting to play your game, to see your game, to see a trailer for four hours, you know? So it's, I think we have to remember to connect more with the players and, uh, and, and to close those borders <laughs> between the users and the, and the developers. And I think, I mean, the industry, I don't know if it's so much harder than or harsher than other industries. I mean, uh, like there's always this, 
I don't know, I, I don't find it so much different apart from the fact that when I found my way to the gaming industry, I found completely in love with it because it's, there's so much passion, I've never seen it before anywhere else. And maybe that's why it's a bit more like uh, delicate or, or it's hard to find a balance between like which conflict up to where is that conflict that I can handle uh, or, or, you know, where is that tipping over the, the verge that I'm getting really angry and it's coming to war. So, uh, yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, it's good because I have a follow-up then. I mean, you paint an image here of, of Gamescom and the long line of people <laughs> waiting yeah. to play your game. I mean, so the developers, do, do, you, do they sneak peek out and like look at the yeah. line and like take the Yeah, 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 definitely. When we were at the Gamescom, like, we tried, that was the recent years at uh, Need for Speed, when we were working in Need for Speed, we sent people who were like, actually from the team. Before that, there was marketing teams going out or brand managers or whatever they were called. But this time, our community managers, but this time it was the team. We were trying to send the people who could, who could really see, like, you know, to connect with the players. And of course, we were taking pictures and sending directly, like, you know, look at the line. And, and it was quite amazing. Not only for our game, it was for different games. Like, it was completely bananas, uh, games come before COVID. Yeah. All right. Okay, we'll come back to that. Uh, now, put that. You have, uh, you have a, 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 a long and windy road in the games industry. You, you, you talked about SteamWorld, SteamWorld series, and then you merged with uh, a, a friend company, uh, maybe? And, and then you added this whole distribution. So how do you navigate through all those uh, changes? How, what's your compass? Yeah, <clears throat> so I was, I was thinking of, about the, the term crossing borders that we were just talking about, because um, yeah, when we, I started out with a very small company, it was just me, and then we, I added a few talented people, and then we started getting somewhere. And then when we were around 20, 25 people, we merged with another studio in Gothenburg uh, called Zoink, so Image and Form, and Zoink we got, we moved in together, and that was, it was a big change for us, because we, suddenly we were, mm, enough people so that we could actually work on more projects than before. Before that, it was typically, we were working on one project, and then, like, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with this as you study game development, that in the beginning it's all slow and, and you drink a lot of beer, and then towards the end, like, everyone is, is working <clears throat> very hard to, to get the game done. And then when you're done with it, you realize that, oh shit, we, now we should have been we should have already had started the next game project. So it's, it's sort of the curse of being, it's the beauty and the curse of being small, that you can you know, sort of work in this way, but then merging with, when Image of Form and Zoink merged, we, we became almost 50 people, and that was a big difference, because suddenly we could move people around on projects, and you could, you could start asking people, what do you want to work on? Like, do you, we have now four projects go, ongoing at the same time. Which one uh, are you most interested in? And so, that was very interesting in sort of a border crossing, uh, crossing way that you could sort of move from, from this team that you'd been on uh, the entire time into a new team and so on. And then, this growth sort of became, uh, uh, I was going to call it a disease or something, but it's sort of, it's, it's been what we are doing now. We are growing because from the beginning, we, we always, from the beginning and now as well, we've always wanted to make the best games possible. And uh, I re we've realized that there are so many wonderful game developers uh, out around the world that we want to bring them in house so that we can sort of. Uh, make the best stuff possible together. So we've acquired quite a few companies and studios around Europe now, and for me, it's, that has certainly been sort of a border crossing experience, because just a couple of weeks ago was the first time that I actually got to meet uh, many, of, many of the developers in England, in Germany, in Spain, uh, and in other places that I'm not gonna talk about here, but uh, it was, it was amazing to meet them. It was amazing to meet them because when you start from the beginning with your own small team and, you, and it grows 
and then suddenly you grow exponentially like you you're not hiring one person at, the, at a time anymore but you're you're sort of doubling this the size then you need to be very careful that you're not growing too fast and that you not sort of lose your footing in the process so traveling around and talking to people and you know actually just fist bumping them or uh, yeah like anyone who dares you hug and then you come and then you come back with with a customary cold that you bring home from GDC or Gamescom but it was wonderful it was tremendous and it, it was it was it was literally uh, like a, a crossing of borders that yeah, I was I was like seven fights <laughs> because uh, it's um, I, I mean uh, it, it was um, a big project, a very ambitious project, and uh, it's not 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 a very easy sell when you're a new. It's your it's your first project in the studio. Um, yeah, so we, we consider a lot of different options, but we're very happy with the with Funko Games, and very happy to have a local publisher. And uh, yeah, so we're happy with the situation now. Like, what what do you think it was that sort of sold it in the end to them? Like, what did you do to to land that deal? Um, I mean, I think I think a big part also of it was that Xbox believed in it first, and that really gave us a stamp of approval, kind of that that we had, um, yeah, that we had that, um, that big on actor that believed in the game and thought it was special, um, and yeah, so I think that was a big part of like when the tide started to change for us in the pitching process for for um, publishers, yeah. So from the other side, then, like, what are you looking for uh, when you're looking at game projects? Uh, definitely that stamp of approval helps. Um, usually we look for sort of uh, the uh, stamp of approval that comes from sort of the target audience. So having, uh, I personally uh, sort of uh, look at how, um, how, how a game studio communicates with its uh, audience through social media or just kind of putting uh, out demos or just videos or whatever uh, and kind of how open they are with the development of the game and uh, you know what they show and uh, in terms of trailers like how, how much traction does a trailer get how many views does a, a trailer get and what sort of comments are there so i'm kind of looking for those qualities where um, the game concept or at least the fantasy of the game is sort of verified against actual players who sort of pick up on on sort of the the idea of the game like it doesn't have to be complete it just needs to sort of um uh, promise something uh, interesting in the end that that people out there understand and can pick up on and say that's the game i always wanted to play sort of that okay. vibe so like the journey should already have begun a little bit like the traction is already there yeah to some extent uh, i guess uh, um, ultimately it also boils down to actually having a playable prototype of some sort uh, it doesn't have to prove everything but it needs to prove that the team behind it can actually make games like in practice and have sort of a, um, uh, a way of uh, working together or if they're working solo then they have you know there are different uh, uh, things you need to prove uh, as a team uh, but behind the curtains it just needs to sort of work uh, uh, to, to satisfying degree mm -hmm. um, so we're here a little bit to talk about the like organic versus accelerated growth. Uh, so like, was it a conscious decision to not uh, take in money from from the outside for you and Fanebase, or was it just yeah, it went so well anyway? Or I think early on when we worked with Past Part Two, we looked at the game and said like this is some really weird shit. No one is going to put money in it. And from that point, it was easier to just kind of because we had the means to get that game out by ourselves. And I think that was a good thing because that also meant that the game didn't grow in scope. We got it out, we got it out fast. And then when we saw that, okay, we had, because we had that verification early on, but we just didn't understand it. And that is probably maybe the difference between many developers and publishers. The publisher can see this is verified, while the words is kind of, I don't know, I just have stuff, I guess. Um, and, and from that point, we kept on making games, and we had the means to, to fund our own games. And then it does, doesn't really make any sense to get any additional funding. Um, I, I think there are cases where it 
might have made sense to take in a publisher if we really wanted to offload some specific part of the of the publishing aspect. But we felt quite comfortable handling all of that by ourselves with QA and localization and, and, and launching the thing. Uh, so so we've kept on doing that ever since. And you haven't considered taking in like uh, VC money or talking to angels or anything? <laughs> we've talked a lot, a lot about it, but we think we always fall back to like we want to have control of our company. We have a, a, a very specific vision that isn't really built on the same scalability that VCs are looking for generally, which means that if we were taking a VC, maybe they're liking our company right now, but down the line they want to see growth. And we're not necessarily here to, here to focus just on growth within our company, because we want to make cool shit as well. Mm -hmm. Has that been a path that you have considered, like taking the more equity uh, uh, focused side? I mean, we'd consider it, but uh, it's not it's not something we've done. And um, I mean, we're we're happy where we are now. We have full funding for uh, for this first game, and but we don't know what's gonna happen in the future. But uh, yeah, I think it's good to look at to not close any doors because it's uh, it's tough being a game developer. And if you want to do like you have your like most developers, I guess that starts uh, they have their dream project that they want to do, um, and there's a lot. Of, Challenges that comes in your in, in your way, and I think uh, I mean maybe it would have made sense for us if it was the right timing and things would have been differently. So I think there's the right timing for for all kinds of uh, different funding. I think mm. depending on what where you are, and of course there's also different kinds of um, equity investors that that some that are totally hands off and some that bring something very valuable to the table that you don't have in the company that that you can more view it as, as a partnership where where you both benefit from it. So yeah, I think there's different paths. Mm. I think you're touching on something very important there, right? No matter which path you take to see it as a partnership, like mm. where each, you know, not just that you're taking money and like, yeah, yeah, I can make games now, but also what other things can it bring you to the company and what will they bring that you might not want. I think it's very important to, to consider yeah. uh, because no money is free, so to speak. Like there's always something else that comes with yeah. it. Uh, and it's not something that you're actually uh, willing to deal with. Um, but before here on stage, uh, they talked a little bit about like it being uh, a seller's market right now. That's kind of uh, a lucrative or like a good environment for game strike game companies right now to get funding. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. You do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um. But this, I think it happens periodically, uh, and I, I think it'll eventually turn uh, for a while and then come back again. Uh, but yeah, I think it's definitely a situation like that. It's, uh, it's fairly easy to get money, and that's a super good thing, obviously, uh, that people are more willing, uh, perhaps than ever, to invest and take risks in, in games. Um, and yeah, so uh, I mean, it, it's a very opportune time right now, uh, and I, mean, I, I think still uh, maybe um, the message should be since since it's easier to get uh, money uh, and, and the environment is sort of more beneficial to uh, game developers, it, it's a good time to really uh, push, try to push the medium to new heights, uh, take on. Uh, greater challenges uh, as uh, game developers. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, I don't know if that uh, uh, makes any sense risk-wise, uh, but uh, it's definitely a, like for for the medium as a whole, it, it's an opportunity to sort of push it to, to new uh, yeah, to new levels. It's time to take the opportunity and create something. Yeah. You know. yeah. Do you agree? With yes. I mean, I, I wouldn't know how the market really looks because we haven't been actively searching for money, so it's kind of hard to take the temperature off of. But I, I trust that. <laughs> <laughs> we were supposed to fight here on stage. We talked about this. <laughs> how do you feel? Um, yeah, maybe the same as Matthias. I think I have a hard time like really taking the pulse on on that how the market looks like. But uh, I'm happy we have funding <laughs> to say that much. Yeah. Uh, but I think personally I can definitely agree. Uh, since my company has taken an angel investment and like, I've been to you know pitch events and stuff like that. And like a, co a couple of just a couple of years ago, uh, investors from other parts of like tech industry were like, oh, I don't understand games. I don't know. I don't know how what to look at. And like, which is fair. Like they never invested in games before. But I think there's definitely like a shift where more and more 
that because we have more and more game successes, like more and more investors are willing to like actually take a look at the games industry. Like this is a viable industry that even if they haven't made investments here before, they are now willing to do so. Uh, so it's uh, I think the landscape is shifting in a good way for us. So more and more money is coming into this industry, which is really cool. Uh, like, do you see any trends towards like has it been very uh, publisher heavy? Like, do more people take in more equity money? Have you seen any shifts like that, or has it been like the same uh, over the past few years? What are the trends when it comes to funding? I think I see more and more publishers trying to kind of like challenge the concept of what a publisher does and try to shift the way they work because it's been very traditional for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is very interesting to see because not all studios need the exact same pre-packaged deal from every publisher. Some people can handle the boarding themselves, some people can handle the risk access the platform themselves. Even some just need money and then you're not really looking at a publisher anymore, you're just looking at a, a fund or that type of thing. So I definitely see like it's, it's opening up and people are trying to challenge that. Mm. And, and with that also, I think um, the, the sort of um, uh, image of, of the, uh, the evil publisher is uh, is slowly being changed to something more positive. It, I, I, I think that's a trend. At least that's what I hope is a trend. But yeah, because n new publishers coming along are trying different things and trying to sort of reimagine how to do publishing to actually you know, create value, um, that uh, hopefully that does have an effect on that old sort of stale image of the, the, the evil publisher. Mm. I mean, there have been more and more actual development companies that become publishers, like you. So, like, I guess that's part. Like, companies have been through, you know, the process of, you know, working with bad publishers, and I like, just don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I think that's. I think you're right. Like, there is a shift towards like better uh, and more, you know, personalized contracts and so on for the companies. Mm -hmm. At least I hope that's the trend. I, I would. I would say so. Uh, at least from since I'm not on the that side, I'm not looking for publishers, but uh, like for, from from my perspective, it's definitely more towards sort of customizing uh, deals that, that fit the game and the, the project and the team around it. So yeah, yeah. Maybe it has to do as well with like it being it's uh, it being a seller's market. Like uh, the companies can be a little bit more picky, I guess. Uh, so like the the publishers have to sort of sell themselves as well, like yeah. give a good deal. Maybe that's part of it. Yes, definitely. Uh, do you think it will last? The sales market? You said it maybe goes a little bit in waves, but like, what do you yeah, think is the future? Uh, no, I, I think it'll shift eventually. It can't go on forever. Like we can't have perpetual growth. Uh, I mean, uh, we can to some extent, but uh, I, I think that at, at some point, uh, enough money will have been invested. Some of those uh, money will be lost, uh, and maybe. Some, some will make a, a profit, uh, but I think at the rate things uh, are, are like money are being invested. I think we will sort of, sort of, uh, at some point cap out and uh, yeah, have a bit, bit of a recess and then come back again eventually. That's at least what I think. It, it, it makes sense. Like eventually, you can only fit that many games on the market, and, and eventually. You're some people will start losing money and that will start to make investor trust go down and then people who maybe be more on the tech side who got into games kind of like, oh no, I'm going back into tech, I'm not going to be in this space anymore. And it's like this natural dance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You agree? Oh. Yeah, I think so. I thought it's interesting that because uh, um, when, when we started, when I started with Plant of Lana in, back in 2017, it was kind of like, okay, I, I didn't know the market at all back then, uh, but it was also like, it's, like I couldn't take the temperature on the on the market how easy it was or not to like do a thing like this, um, and it's just interesting that it's it's impossible of course to see in, into the future, and you can't really predict how the like climate like the pandemic hit just before we started like we had our proof of concept demo and started like really um, trying to find a deal and that. Um, Ended up not affecting so much as we thought, but we were quite scared. And it's uh, it's just uh, what I'm trying to say is just that it's uh, when you start, you should just go ahead as well because you like not be afraid of like if, if, if there's like a trend of it going on because like you said, it probably goes in cycles. So yeah. very 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 uh, difficult to 
to uh, to know because it's, it was like when the TMDC exploded back in uh, like ten years ago, um, and then yeah, the climate the climate changes, but then again, new opportunities also uh, arise. So yeah, that was basically my my two cents on that. I also think you can add on that like it, even if it's a seller's market, you also have way more sellers than we used to have. Like you have more and more actors coming in all the time, so the quality bar is always increasing. So even if, if publishers have many to pick up from, from, from their becoming increasingly better games with each mm. year, that has this magic sauce that you can have. No? Uh, do you see any like differences between like what it looks like in Sweden and other countries, like when it comes to the choice of funding or the availability of, of funding, you know, money in the market and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Germany has a really strong funding program for for games, where you basically can get half of the funding for a games project. Like, and I think it's starting at a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand uh, euro. Uh, so, so yeah, it's de it definitely covers sort of uh, maybe not the solo indie project. Those uh, probably don't have a very good chance of being funded. But again, smaller indie projects with like budgets of maybe five hundred thousand uh, euro would uh, like it. It seems to be targeted for them. Um, it's it's a bit of uh, work I've been told with. Uh, the whole bureaucracy around it, uh, filling in uh, all sorts of forms and stuff like that, and really jumping through a lot of uh, hoops, uh, I suppose, uh, to, to make it look like a good in, in terms of uh, all the bureaucracy. But uh, uh, in the end, you also get a bunch of free money, basically. Uh, so it's pretty good i would say that that's gonna once that sort of kicks in fully i think we'll see some pretty good stuff coming out of uh, germany uh, and yeah still like uh, and that's coupled with all of the sort of because uh, that's public funding right mm -hmm. uh, but that's also co uh, coupled with all the grants that are available uh, public and also from like epic mega grants and stuff like that but then you have also the publisher money and the investor money of course so it's uh, uh, it seems like uh, Germany is definitely one of the places to be right now. Right. Uh, so we should look out, they're coming for yeah. us. <laughs> I've not really seen anything similar in Sweden in terms no. of public funding yet. Uh, but yeah, uh, we're, uh, we're a smaller uh, nation population-wise, so uh, we have perhaps more publishers per capita. <laughs> so that's always something. Yeah, we don't have that many grants and so on. But, but Matthias, you have at least applied for one grant that I know of? Yeah, we're trying to apply for an art grant right now. That mm. was one hell of a journey. Because uh, yeah. like, the, the whole application is that it's all text-based. You're not allowed to mention yourself or your game or what you worked on before. So it's all an uh, anonymous. And then you have to like write an essay of why your game is going to be co cool culturally. Uh, so that was like yeah, the, the, the polar opposite of like how, how a pitch usually goes, right? But it, but it was fun. But yeah, Sweden has a very shitty architecture when it comes to, to brands. Like, it barely, barely existed at all. I think Germany seems to be a really good place. I think Finland also has. I think they've come up to 50% as well. Uh, and, and I think maybe that could be the reason, because they always have this conversation of like, oh, all the games are too to corporate or to businessy, like yeah, but maybe people are not al allowing themselves to take risks because there aren't any of these grants where you where you can kind of take a chance to take a risk. Mm. It's a bit of a catch twenty two almost. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it would have been really great with some grants out like that, but uh, let's not forget uh, the gaming incubator, for example, that mm. uh, we were a part of. That they helped us a lot, not with like uh, pure grants that we could pay employees with, but it allowed us to go here back in two thousand and eighteen. It was our first like fair conference where we could meet um, actual publishers and investors and the industry and also allowed us to go over the world on different conferences allowing us to meet uh, investors and publishers so I think they have really helped us a lot and have given us quite a big chunk of money if you count like what what we've been able to do with that it's just not we couldn't pay salaries with it but it still allowed us I think uh, Science Park Club and Sweden Game Arena and the Gaming Incubator has helped us immensely and I think that's a really good pro 
Okay. Okay. So when we, we went through the same mm -hmm. uh, thing process and like they are able to alleviate a lot of the, the yeah. early costs. Just getting a place to, to have your office is, is huge when starting up. Yeah, when you don't know the industry, it's kind of like a, it's a wall of, of uh, like before I was just a consumer loving games, and but you don't know the, the even if you know games, you don't know the industry, and it's just like how do I get in contact with like uh, uh, someone like uh, someone that works at Xbox so I can pitch my game or, or whatever. It's, it's been I think that, that uh, it can't be understated how important that is to allow people to just come in contact with the industry and, and giving and sharing sharing your knowledge uh, of, of uh, and your experiences. I think. Really valuable as well. Yeah, for sure. Like just a conference like this, just yeah. meeting people and like you know these spontaneous meetings that hopefully we can have again now that the pandemic yeah. is not over, but uh, getting there uh, is so important. So definitely, so like having these like um, this infrastructure that we have in Sweden, I think it's I don't know if we have, if that's uh, available anywhere else in the world really, like to the extent that we have here, um, maybe Finland and so on. Um, I mean, and in Stockholm as well, like, so I was part of something called Stadium, you know, we had the same thing, and like, just that being able to go to the market a little bit faster, yeah, because people helping you set up the company and so on, like, that's so valuable. Even if it's not money itself, like, it helps you get to that first money. I actually started my hand last week, which is for Hopier, um, and then uh, Aaron Gay's uh, job application showed up, and uh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we might have all heard about a little bit of a success story, uh, about a little miking game that some people have played. Um, so we're gonna talk a little about that. Um, so uh, it's been a while now, I think eight months since the release uh, or the, the early access, something like that. At least that's what one would say. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping you knew. <laughs> February. Uh, so what has the experience been since the release of Alheim? Uh, a roller coaster. <laughs> it, uh, in the beginning, it was it was so much. It was uh, a bit of chaos. Uh, a bit. A bit. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, very hectic. Uh, now it has calmed down a bit, and when we release updates, it gets up again. And then, but we have learned a lot, I think, all of us. Mm. It was. It was nice, it was scary, <laughs> it was basically all the feelings you have in the spectrum. Uh, it was, uh, no, mo mostly it was humbling. It was really, like when you didn't have the expectation that it was going to be anything but like small. It's going to be a small game for a specific small little audience. When it blew up, it was like, what? Is that yeah. imposter syndrome coming towards me now? <laughs> it, it was. was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. Uh, but no, it was a strange feeling, and that, uh, that people even know about the game it was so strange because it's, yeah. it's. For me, it was like, oh, it's just a game here in Hopte. <laughs> <Doop -de -doo. laughs> uh, but no, it was. It was great. But also, it was scary. <laughs> yeah. like, like all the the bugs that came in and everything that that we weren't really prepared for as a small team, and uh, we weren't really able to handle it. But we did the best we could. It was more or less like a war zone where it was like triage, trying to save what we can, do the best we can. What do we have to fix? Where where do we have to focus? Uh, so that kept going for like three months. Yeah. And you said, <laughs> and once you're like, I need. Ten more leases, <laughs> <laughs> but you got two. <laughs> and they're not even leases. <laughs> they're not even leases. <laughs> they're really good, though. Yeah, they are. Thank you. <laughs> so, so why why did it happen? Like, what's the key, what clicked so well with people? Like, was it the right game at the right moment? Like, what was it that connected? I think that's a really hard question to answer. I think in a way it was the right game at the right moment. Um, since we had a pandemic and people were at home and then we released a multiplayer game where you could hang out with your friends and not necessarily compete with them, just hang out uh, and go on adventures. But then I also think like the Viking theme is quite popular and really strong and has a lot, like a very broad audience and then uh, there's also like a lot of genres found in uh, Valheim. It's buildings, exploration, adventuring, fighting, 
and yeah, I think it speaks to a lot of people. I think one of the things that we read a lot that we get and we still get emails from is like how how people have there's a big distance between people now that the pandemic is going on and how it actually brought them together being able to play with your brother again who you didn't play with that much or and I think that spreads well with the bombing mm. and all the small things that you might not expect in games you try to add basically but it's a whole pandemic thing and I mean it was easy an easy game to stream I mean, you get trees falling on you and killing you. <laughs> I mean, that was that was the first week, by the way. I don't know how, how many people died the first week from just falling, <laughs> cutting trees. <laughs> that was amazing. So, so you think the pandemic worked in your favor uh, for the success of the game? I think it has a, a small factor, yeah. at least. Um, I, we don't really know why. <laughs> I mean, there, we can't really point to anything and yeah. say it was this or that. But we like to think it, it's a, a pretty polished... What well, I love to say. Yes. I think it's I pretty think polished so. uh, for early access. <laughs> for early access. Yes. <laughs> no, but I think maybe you're onto something like people want to connect, right? And they want to, as I said, like not compete every time with... with your friends, you know, you want to just hang out in yeah. an environment and do stuff together. And I think that's really something like, mm -hmm. so like, I know that Sea of Thieves, for example, had an upspring during the pandemic as yeah. well. Like you want to just chill with your friends yeah. and you can't meet up in person. Um, so yeah. But how, how has the pandemic uh, sort of affected you as a company, like the way you worked? Uh, how has that been for you? I mean, just releasing the game and having the success that we had was really strange because we worked from home and we didn't meet, so we, we didn't celebrate. Uh, we, have yet to, we haven't celebrated yet. We haven't no. celebrated. No. <laughs> we haven't had a release party. We <laughs> Are you going to have one now that it's opening up a little bit? I hope so. <laughs> um, it feels strange to have it so far off. I mean, we could have like an after, after, after celebration. <laughs> when leaving early access? Yeah. Oh, well, that, that too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we uh, work from home from uh, December. And I think, yeah, and we just came back, which is really nice. And I think it helps like morale to be able to meet each other and have lunch together. And, and so I think it definitely has affected the team. Uh, yeah, the, pand the pandemic has definitely affected the team. Mm. I would say the coffee breaks. Coffee breaks, yeah. The coffee breaks uh, and all the, the weird, strange ideas that come out of coffee breaks. <laughs> Because you, you don't tend to call up someone and sit and drink your coffee on Discord no, yeah. and like, what if we did this? <laughs> uh, it, it comes from sitting down together, having a small idea, and uh, Eric saying something that leads to something else. Richard says something and it's just, oh, like, okay, great. Let's put in a trash can that has lightning. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> You have a lot of like, crazy ideas, right? You're not going to go with someone with that idea. Like, you're not no. going to call them up and like, hi, I have this. Like, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But over, you know, a cup of coffee. Like, it yeah. Doesn't happen. yeah. Um, so you talked about like Vikings maybe resonating with people. Uh, how, why Vikings in the first place? Like, what the? Oh, why, why did this game go in the direction that it did? Or I think maybe you. Mine. I might. That's better than me. <laughs> Because you have done hair longer. Oh right, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, I think it's because Richard wanted to make something uh, with Vikings back back in the day. Uh, which was actually going to be an MMO. Or a PvP game as well. But he just started with Vikings basically. And I think a lot of companies just started with Vikings around that stage. And then all the Viking games came out <laughs> this year. <laughs> It feels very Viking y for a Viking game, though. Like, it's, uh, it has more of that vibe that I at least you know, uh, envision when it comes to Vikings, right? I, I, I hope so. <laughs> we, we, try to stick, we try to be a little bit more, uh, we try to stick to like, what's realistic to have in a Viking game, but, but obviously we've got dragons. And I, they're, they're so it doesn't unreal. have to be that realistic. <laughs> It's more of Viking like legend, maybe. Viking yeah. legend, oh, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah, I think sticking to what people know about Vikings rather than 
this is exactly what Vikings was. Mm. So are you doing any research on what the bike was actually like? Part of the year is when we release <laughs> the annual numbers, the report <laughs> of the state of the industry, how many jobs, how many proner, how many games, how many companies. And it's a lot of work because there's, those numbers are so big. It takes a long, long time to count those numbers. And we're not ready to launch the report yet. It's coming on October 26. But we here, we're here today with you to share a sneak peek. So this is like a hush, hush sneak peek. Uh, this is only for you. We made it special for you. And to, here to present these numbers is none other than my colleague and friend, like they always say in American shows, Johanna Nilander, the chief analyst for Data Space Russia. Johanna! Take it away. So happy to be here and to be back in Kulde, where my days of game development started a long, long time ago. So, let's start quick. Let's go back to 2010. Uh, in that year, Battlefield Bad Company was the best-selling game in Sweden with nine copies, nine million copies. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the data report we, we presented back then. We had an annual turnover of 1.2 billion Swedish kroners. That's 1.2 milliarder Swedish kroners. The revenue from the industry was the increasing 15 million Swedish kroners. And it was 115 companies working with video games in Sweden and a bit over a thousand employees. So this was just 10 years ago. And a lot of things can happen in a, in a decade. We have a new decennium, because this year we are presenting the 2020 the 20 data. Uh, this year we have added new sources with, uh, from the Statistical Bureau of Sweden. We have a lot more companies coming in, because we've found a lot more, more companies. We have a lot more complexity behind the companies, because you are forming new structures and groups of companies and holding companies. And you, you go on the stock exchange and you buy up new companies. So it's, it's, it's a lot more complex than, than back then. But public data is still the base of, um, uh, of our, our data set. And we have also statistical challenges of, of gender. It's, it's very binary in, in a statistical frame point and uh, diversity isn't really, um, isn't really presented uh, because of legal reasons and privacy issues as well. So let's take a look on how it's going. And I think you all recognize Val Haim, or at least you should. So for this year's annual report, you remember like 1.2 billion? We're now up to almost 35 billion Swedish kroners of turnover. So this is an increase of over 10 billion kroners from the last years. We have a revenue of you remember those 15 millions 10 years ago, now it's up to 7.5 billion. So it's a, it's a profitable business. And we have over 600 companies, 667 to be exactly, last year. And we are over 6,000 people employed in Sweden and over 7,000 people employed by Swedish companies abroad. And um, we, are, we are more, a lot more than 6,000, but, but we are still finalizing that, that data. That's a lot. Take pictures. I'm going to the next slide now. Just to illustrate the growth of the industry for, for the last 10 years. It's happening a lot and it's really increasingly 
growing. And I actually, I think it's uh, previous years when I worked with this, I'm always a bit nervous when it comes to, to gathering the data because what, what if, uh, what if uh, Mojang have a, have a bad year? What, what will happen if Candy Crush doesn't sell? But nowadays, there's so many different companies who are bringing the, the financial stakes, who are bringing the games, who are bringing the successes, who are employing the people, that we are a much better and diverse industry in, in every type of way, which, which also makes it easier and, and more foreseeable, I think. And it's a strength for the industry because it doesn't depend on, on one or two single companies anymore. I also think that Skövde, where we are today, is a, is a great example of that because uh, just a few years ago there was also just maybe one or maybe two major companies here, but now we can see that a tenth of the national industry revenues come to companies registered in Skövde. And then you should also know that there are a couple of companies in Skövde that are registered on other places because, because you have studios here. Um, so that's a lot, and uh, I also took a look at the, the company taxes. These um, uh, some of the web the based studios are um, are bringing in, and uh, that's all actually the same amount as the annual budget for culture and recreation in in the city of Kvarda. So there's a lot of tax money coming in from from game companies as well. Um, and especially here, I think that's good to know, especially here where we have good and healthy ecosystems with the city, the university, the incubator, and the industry. Uh, and uh, Skövde is, is exceptional in, in many, many ways, but it's not the only successful hub in Sweden. I think we have a lot of different game clusters. We have, of course, a great industry in, in Stockholm, but we also have uh, Malmö, we have up in the north, we have at Arctic and Boden, and we have Karlstad and Linköping, and, and there are things happening in a lot of places around in Sweden. And, and as a national trade association, which I'm working for as well as PAC, it's really nice to see that, that the whole country is, is growing in, in that sense. And that's me. Thank you.